Hi everyone, my name is Shashank and I'm a data analyst that makes videos on YouTube on how you can become a data analyst. I actually am on my journey to become a data scientist and in that journey I am reading Aurelien Garon's book Hands-On Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, and Keras. And uh, as I'm going through every single chapter, I am taking my knowledge, what I learned, my notes, my code, and then sharing that with you guys. So today we're going over chapter five, support vector machines of uh, the book Hands-On Machine Learning. All right, so let us get started. I'm going to put myself in the corner over here so I don't take up nearly as much room. This is actually a bit of a short chapter, so this video won't be nearly as long as many of the other ones that we have. But right before I start the video, I wanted to go through two things with you guys. Um, if you're interested, I also have a TikTok where I actually answer questions that people ask me just because TikTok makes it super easy to uh, answer questions that people ask you. A lot of people uh, mention that, for example, TikTok doesn't work in India and um, uh, YouTube Shorts are available, but YouTube Shorts are just honestly just not as good as TikTok as far as the back and forth conversation you can have with uh, other creators and people who ask you questions. So while I will continue to make YouTube videos 100%, my TikTok is where I do a lot of just like question answering because it's so easy to do it there. Uh, and it's a lot of fun too. As you can see, I do a data analyst interview questions, you know, success tips, stuff like that. Just easy to make content that I think is useful for many, many different people. And if you are interested in helping support me and the content that I create, um, you know, I try to make it as free as possible. You can go ahead and join my Patreon. If you join my Patreon, not only will you get access or not only will you be supporting my work, um, which is, you know, of course, the main aspect of the Patreon. You will also be, um, you will get access to all the notes that I have on the uh, various topics that we go over in these videos. And uh, there is also a Discord community that I try and stay somewhat active with. I would like to turn it into something a little bit bigger, but uh, right now I'm really focused on just putting out videos for as many people as possible. But if you're interested in supporting me and my work, uh, please um, check out the Patreon. Okay, so now let's go ahead and get started. Let me bring in the notes over here. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a little bit of a short chapter and there's not gonna be that much code that we're gonna be going over. And there's actually a back half of this chapter, like the second half of the chapter. They get into the real nitty gritty of the math you'll need to know to like really understand SVMs. Um, my purpose with going through this book is to understand how uh, machine learning at a uh, beyond surface level, but most importantly at a very practical level. So what can I actually like apply in my day-to-day uh, -day work? Um, not at all to say that math isn't useful, but it's uh, not going to be the focus of this series over here. The focus is really like, what do we need to know in order to apply the what we're learning over here? So I'm going to be skipping over the math section. Hopefully I can come back to it in the future and we can go over it together. But uh, for right now, it didn't make much sense to me and I don't think it's, uh, I, I think it, going over it would distract from like getting further down in the book. So. Let us take a look at what we have over here. So support vector machines, what are they? So they are basically a supervised machine learning model that you can use in order for uh, to, to um, do classification or regression problems. And the basic idea behind an SVM is it will take all of your data over here. So for example, let's like look at this data set over here where you, the green is one class uh, and the blue is another class. And it will try and fit the largest quote unquote street in between the two classes and um, you and, and use that in order to classify future observations. Um, and this is why it's called a support vector machine. You know, you have your vectors over here and they are supported by the values on the edge. Uh, and, and I should also mention all these uh, orange values are the ones that they were trying to uh, predict. Um, okay, so what we are saying is that there are multiple ways in order for you to create this tree. You can either say, um, okay, if anything is on the opposite side of the street, so for example, if any of these blue values are on the um, green side or vice versa, then this is a margin violation and this is off the, uh, and these are, um, uh, sorry, these are margin violations and if this is a problem and you want to avoid this entirely, then you're using something called a hard margin classification as we talk about over here. Uh, the alternative is soft margin classification, which is probably the better alternative in most cases given that you are rarely going to find a data set that can be perfectly separated into two different, uh, two distinct halves or multiple distinct, uh, you know, thirds or quarters or whatever. And we can use the hyperparameter C, as you'll see in a minute, in order to uh, increase or decrease the number of margin violations allowed. A lower C will lead to a wider street and therefore a stricter um, SV, a support vector machine. And a smaller C will reduce, I'm sorry, a larger C will reduce the width of the street, therefore allowing for more, uh, a more liberal um, uh, SVM. 
So let's go ahead. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, SBM classifiers do not output probabilities for each class. So let's go ahead and make an SBM. So I'll put these notes over here. And for anyone interested in getting these notes, so I, I will show the full notes in this video, but if you'd like like a paper copy of these notes or something that you could like print or copy or something like that, those are available on my Patreon. Uh, but I don't want to withhold the knowledge, so you'll see all the notes over here. Just uh, if you want, if you don't want to like have to rewrite all of them, they're available on my Patreon. All right, so let's go ahead and create a quick SVM. So we're going to be using something called the Iris data set. So these are basically, uh, th this is a really common machine learning data set where you have two different irises, um, the, the flower, um, and using like petal widths, you are tasked with figuring out, okay, is it one type of iris or another type of iris? And this is like a super common data set that people use whenever they are um, testing out machine learning classifiers. All right, so let us go ahead and we will create our first classifier. So I've gone ahead and I've already imported all the relevant libraries over here. Um, and let's see, I want to create the iris data sets. Let's just say iris equals, uh, what was it again? It was like datasets dot load iris. And then I wonder what happens if I do this. There we go. Okay, so here is what the iris data set looks like. So this is, Ah, okay, and then I think if we do it like, there we go, yeah, iris data equals that. And then I think if you do like iris um, target, uh, and, and, and yeah, zeros are one class and ones are another class and twos are another class, there we go. Yeah, so you have uh, multiple classes over here. Um, so we have our data and our target. So let's go ahead and set our X variable to be the data. And then I only wanna include some of the data over here. So Let's go ahead and do this over here, two to three, and then we'll take a look at what that gives us. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So this gives us a good looking data set that we can use to predict our SVMs, or that we can use to train our SVM. And let's say y equals iris uh, target, and then we will call this, and no, we will say, I think what we want to do is we want to actually put this inside parentheses. Whoops. Equals two. Uh, as type np dot load sixty four. And then let's see what we get if we do y. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So yeah, we're, we're getting the correct one. So we have our zeros and our ones over here. Awesome. And let's just go ahead and start training the SVM. So machine learning, uh, as you guys have probably figured out right now, like it is actually super simple to implement these days. Like you can implement a full-fledged classifier in like five lines of code. I think what people, um, what data scientists get paid a lot of money to do and what people like respect them for and what people like want them to do is to know all of the um, intricacies of like what should we use why should we use it um, what should we do in like interesting situations how do you get the data into a certain format but strictly like doing or strictly like creating a machine learning algorithm is not hard anymore that it used to be but uh, not anymore so we'll call this SVM CLF so support vector machine classifier and we will just do uh, we'll make a pipeline so pipeline and then put in a bracket for our list. Oh, whoops, I'll do the enter over there. That way I can make a very clean list. And we're gonna, for scale our variables. So with support vector machine, scaling is very, very important. Not all um, machine learning algorithms care about scaling all that much, uh, but many do. So for example, if you were to do a neural network, I believe neural networks are quite sensitive to scaling, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So you definitely wanna be scaling in that. but. Uh, and, and then like, you know, like linear classifiers are very sensitive to scaling, but there are some that are not. I, I think decision trees are not uh, that, uh, they don't care much for whether you are scaling or not. All right, so now we've created our scaler. Now let's also do our, um, now let's do our actual like, classifier. <coughs> let's do our actual classifier. Um, and then what do we have here? We have we our hyperparameter c let's make that a one that's what he does in the book and then we will do our loss as a hinge function all right 
svm clf dot fit x y. Okay, cool. So we've trained our classifier. We've scaled our data and we've trained our classifier. And then let us go ahead and do a prediction. So svm clf and the example he uses in the book dot predict, and it's going to be um, you have to like double up the brackets over here. I think it's like 5.5 .5 and like 1.7 or something like that. Cool, and we got a prediction of one over here. So this is, you know, this is how simple it is to implement one of these classifiers, as you can see. So bring in the notes back over here. I have that code over here, so when you get these notes, you'll see the code right over there. Um, and what you might have noticed is that, you know, this is a linear data set, so it's quite simple, but what happens if we have a non-linear data set? So this is where the SVM stuff gets interesting. So SVMs are super simple if you're using linear data sets, but like, what if you, how do you separate data that comes in like, like really wonky shapes, right? And that's where we can do um, two different things. So one thing you can do is you can add features to the data set. So for example, the example I give in the book over here is that you have these uh, green and blue features on a line. But what if we add, oh, sorry, these green and blue observations on a line, and the line represents a feature. So remember, what, what is a feature? A feature is just a column in our data set. If we're thinking about like a two-dimensional two pandas data frame, then um, a feature is just a column in that data set. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and add another dimension or another feature. So the words dimension, feature, column, these are all like interchangeable, they're all the same thing. Uh, and then so in this case, what they did is they added a y-axis over here. Also, I mean, they call it x2, but you know, it's a y-axis, right? And then so what happens is when you do that, you realize, oh, it looks like the blue observations actually are quite different when you are looking at them through this feature, through this um, uh, column over here. And then when we do that, we can just linearly separate the variables using this red line over here. So that's one thing you can do. You can go ahead and add polynomial features. So for example, what they do over here is, um, and, and make moons is just a data set that's like, it's, it's uh, purpose created to illustrate this point. Um, what you do is you go ahead and add a feature and what you do is by using a polynomial feature of degree three, meaning x cubed, you do that first and then you scale and then you can do the same linear SVC and get exactly what you were uh, uh, getting earlier. You, you're able to actually like separate the data out very cleanly using just a linear value. Now another thing you can do, oh sorry and I should mention, um, the one problem with this, right, is that as you scale more and more and more, um, it gets computationally incredibly complex. If you think about it, right, it has to it has to add umpteenth. You know, maybe you're doing this with like tw a degree of twenty, right? Um, it becomes more precise, but it's also computationally way more complex for the computer to do this. And then, so this only really works for like low degree polynomials. So what you want to do in that case is you want to do something called the kernel trick. Um, and actually, I have a video over here. I didn't create this video, someone else did. And they created it like 11 years ago, this Udi guy. Um, and it's a great video. And what it does is it illustrates what the kernel trick is. So what the kernel trick does is it tries to transform the data by creating it, uh, by, by separating it on a different plane. So for example, like let's look at this over here, right? You see the blue data and the red data. And obviously it can't be separated right now. Like it can as a circle, but not in its current state by a single plane or a single line, which is what the SVM needs to do. The SVM can only separate like by a plane or a line. And then so what this does, the kernel trick will change the entire shape of the data. And as you can see, here's what it used to be down here. And now you can see the blue values tend to be down here at the bottom of this kind of like 3D parabola and the red values are above it. And by doing that, you now can linearly separate the data right over here using a plane. So you see he brings in this like purple plane over here and that's the kernel trick. Um, I'll go ahead and put a link to this guy's video. Um, go ahead and give them some views. I know the, the video is like 11 years old, but um, it, it's, or well, 14 years old at this point. Um, but it's a tremendous video and illustrates exactly what, um, how the kernel trick works. Another website I link in the uh, notes at the bottom is, excuse me, this over here where it shows what happens. I link down here where it shows what happens when you um, use a kernel trick to like linearly separate your data. Because the SVM itself cannot make this shape because it's, it's um, just a vector, remember? So it goes in a straight line. So what you have to do is you have to transform the entirety of the data. And after you transform the data, then you can go ahead and linearly separate it. 
And that's the that's the uh, kernel trick. Now the next thing that they go over in the chapter is the similarity function, which is like it's it's another way you can use to um, implement the kernel trick, where basically you are trying to link all of the data to landmarks. You're trying to link the data points to landmarks on the uh, plane. So gamma is a regularization parameter. So you can see what happens is you add gamma. You, it's the, it works the exact same as the previous um, uh, SVM classifiers, except now you're just adding a gamma parameter, which is a regularization parameter, and it, it um, helps prevent overfit in your data. And then finally in the chapter, they just go over how you can use SVMs for, re for um, regressions um, as well. And it's the exact same thing, except instead of SVC, you just use SVR. And that really is all they went over in this chapter. So then after that, they have this whole entire like under the hood section where they go over the individual uh, or the, the mathematical equations and stuff that like underlie SVMs. Honestly, it's above my ability to understand them and definitely above my ability to explain them. So I really hope to come back to that in the future. But SV, oh, whoops. But the, uh, SV uh, support vector machines are actually a quite powerful machine learning algorithm you can use. And they're kind of like the first like real machine learning algorithm that we go over. Like a lot of people will say like linear, um, linear regression, regression is not like real machine learning. And like, honestly, I kind of agree. That's like basic statistics. Um, and, and maybe SVM is too. Um, you know, again, I'm learning this stuff along with you guys. Um, but that's really support vector machines. And that's, that's all it is over there. So. Uh, next week, or well, next uh, chapter, we're going to be going over decision trees, and there's going to be a lot more content over there. I was looking at the chapter, and it's a lot longer. Uh, if you guys have a copy of the book, you'll see how short the SVM chapter is, especially if you exclude the under the hood stuff. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. I try and answer them. Um, I highly recommend following my TikTok only because that's like where I'm, I, it's just a lot of fun to interact with people on TikTok because like people will like react to what you say and everything. Uh, and it's just a platform that like, it, it really encourages communication between creator and uh, consumer. So thank you guys so much for joining and I hope you have a good day.